Okay, this is section 6-1, discrete random variables. You'll want to definitely have your notes with you. Um, it will, they will help you answer several of these initial questions. What is a random variable? So a random variable is a numerical measure of the outcome of a probability experiment. So that's option B here for mine. Okay. We'll discuss all the details. You'll see how it unfolds as we go through some of our problems that are related to these discrete random variables. Uh, number two, what are the two requirements for a discrete probability dis distribution? Well, the thing is, is that you guys actually already know the answer to this question. We've gone over this many times. It's also in your notes, but recall from previous sections that there are two things that we always needed to have when we were doing probabilities. Number one was that always your probabilities would end up be, would be between zero and one. So they could be zero, exactly zero, hence the equal to, and they could be exactly one, hence the equal to on one. So C would not be a correct option because C eliminates the option because it does not have an equal to here for probabilities to not occur or to guarantee it occurred essentially. And so that is the first criteria. The second criteria that we already have reviewed before, but you may not be aware of the way it's written, is that we've stated before that the sum, the sigma sum of all of your probabilities needs to equal one. We actually use that in the very beginning of the semester when we did our um, distributions, frequency distributions. So um, there it is, on to the next one. Determine whether the random variable is discrete or continuous. Now, in your notes, there is a uh, comparison between discrete and continuous. It, it lists in your notes several characteristics about each of them. They are different, and let's take a look here. So, um, the number of light bulbs that burn out in the next week in a, in room, in a room with 15 bulbs. Now, here's the deal. If you're looking at your notes, the easiest way to determine if you're dealing with discrete is if you can count using the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Okay? If you see a decimal, a fraction, if you can count in, per, in even more precise terms, that means that you're not dealing with a discrete random variable. A discrete random variable essentially counts using whole numbers. So in this case, if we're counting the number of light bulbs that burn out in the next week in a room with 15 bulbs, can we count one and a half bulbs that burn out? No, the bulb is either on or off, working or not working, lit or burnt out. So you can count literally exactly the amount of bulbs. Therefore, this would be a discrete random variable because the possible values are 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on through 5. This would not be continuous because, and, that, and I'll talk about continuous now, continuous variables are ones in which we can count the in-between. So in your, if you're looking at your notes, discrete random variables are, and I'll just abbreviate it D, discrete ra random variables would have precise points if we were to say plot it on a number line. So we can count these bulbs as zero burnt out, one burnt out, two burned out, three burned out, and so on. However, continuous, if this case were to be a continuous one, we would have zero burned out, 0.5 burned out, 1 burned out, 1.2 burned out, and so on. We could count the light bulbs that burned out in an in-between sense. In-between here would represent some kind of a sort of burned out light bulb, but of course that's not the case here. As I mentioned earlier, a light bulb is either on or off. It's working or it's not. It is lit or it's burnt out. So discrete is a very good um, uh, uh, app usage or descriptor or um, application in this case, or this is applies to uh, discrete applies to this case. All right, let's take a look at part B. 
the amount of rain in city B during April. Now, if we come back to our little picture here, do we measure rain in zero inches, one inch, two inch, three inch, or do we measure rain in zero, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, one, 1.3, 1 1.5? Can we measure rain in more precise terms um, than just single digit units? And of course, the answer is yes. We can certainly measure rain in this case. It's not an either on or off in the case of the light bulb. So because rain can be measured in that manner, then these discrete selections are completely off the table. And so we know that we're dealing with the continuous. Now, D is not the correct answer because this is incorrect. Continuous variables do not have just whole number selections. Instead, B would be the correct answer because we can have anything greater than or equal to zero, being that it could just keep on going and we could get precise answers, more, more precise answers. Okay, there it is. All right, on to number four. Now, in number four, what we do is we first decide if this is a discrete probability distri distribution. Now, what you're gonna do is you are going to call upon or use again um, that, that definition in your notes that we've seen kind of all semester long. And there were two criteria that we worked on in, in a previous problem. The first criteria was that all of your values would be between zero and one. So are all of these values for probabilities? Note that this is the probability of this event happening. So getting a zero has a probability of 0.23, getting a one has a probability of 0.22, and so on. Well, are all of those between zero and one? Yes, they are. So they satisfy the first criteria of, a prob of being a probability distribution. The second criteria, as we discussed earlier, is do all of these add up to one? So they must add up to one to form the full kind of pie, if, if you want to think about it that way, or the full total. And so if those all add up to one, then it is meeting both criteria. And so you can check that um, by adding all those up. They do. And so for your problem, you need to check that as well. So what would we select? It's definitely a yes. Is it because the sum of the probabilities equal one? Yeah, but that's not just it. D, yes, because each probability is between zero and one. Yes, but it neglected to mention the other half, which we talked about earlier. C, yes, because the sum of the probabilities is equal to one and each probability is between zero and one. And that is just a, a re iteration or another a, a way to practice what we saw in the earlier problem which was just simply theoretical and a definition this is actually an application to test whether you understand um, if a probability distribution meets those two criteria okay let's move on number five determine whether the distribution is a discrete probability distribution now Recall the definition that we discussed earlier of what discrete versus continuous is. Discrete is when we can, and I probably should have actually left that up there, uh, count it, but it's in your notes, in exact pieces, in steps, and there's no in-between. Continuous is if we see some decimals or we see some uh, values that are not whole numbers. And so let's take a look here. We have... Um, X values of 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, and we have probabilities for each of them. Is the distribution a discrete probability distribution? And the answer would be, uh, well, let's see here. No, because the sum of probabilities is not equal to one. That's not true. The sum of the probabilities is equal to one. Yes, because the sum of the probabilities is equal to one. That actually is an option. So it looks like actually they're not even Asking, they're just kind of driving, driving home the point from the previous problem. So this is actually just another example of the previous problem we came from checking those two criteria. That's true, but recall that we have two criteria to satisfy. 
No, because the probability is not between zero and one. No, it is zero and one. Let's take a look at C. Yes, because the sum of the probabilities is equal to one. Technically they are. These are all the probabilities. Getting 100 has zero, 200 is zero, 300 is zero, 400 is zero, 500 is one. So if that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Basically there's no chance of these four um, events occurring. The, the event of getting a 500 has a probability of one. So that's okay. Uh, it's not evenly spread out or it doesn't have dis different probabilities based like the previous problem, but that's okay. And each probability is between zero and one. And that's true. These probabilities are between zero and one. And recall that we said that you could have zero and or you could have one. You could have those as your probabilities. So this is correct. Okay, let's take a look at number six. Okay, so we have another one and it looks like we are continuing to uh, check the two criteria for a probability dis distribution or more specifically, a discrete probability distribution. So we've got some values and the probability of each of those values occurring or those events occurring. Is the distribution a discrete probability distribution? Well, remember, two criteria have to be met. First and foremost, the probabilities must be between zero and one. Are they? Yes, they are. 0.5 is between zero and one, so that's true. The second thing is, all the probabilities in your distribution must, when summed or added together, equal one. Does that happen here? Well, 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 is one, and then we add more. That would ex All these would exceed one. We would end up with a total of 2.5, which that is not equaling one. So because that's the case, this would not be a probability distribution. Let's take a look. No, because each probability is not between zero and one. That's not true because they are. But the, the other criteria that failed was that the sum of the probabilities is not equal to one. And that is what causes this discrete probability distribution to fail. All right, let's take a look at number seven. Determine the required value of the missing probability to make the distribution a discrete probability distribution. All right, if you've done a good job up to this point, you know that there are two criteria that must be met for a probability distribution to be discrete. Criteria number one is that all the values, all the probabilities must be between zero and one. They can be decimals as they should be, and, they, and so as a result, they must be between zero and one. So far, that looks good. And the other criteria that we learned is that all of these, when added together, should equal one. So if I need to determine what the probability of obtaining a four would be, then I simply need to do what? Subtract these values, because we know that together, they should equal one along with the four, and by subtracting 0 0.28, 0 0.46, and 0 0.05 from one, or you can just do minus, 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 it doesn't really make a difference, but all of these probabilities are the other probabilities, and so if I subtract them from that one, that is going to tell me what my missing value or missing probability for obtaining a four is. So let's go take a look at that and what that would end up being. So, um, well, let's see here. So let's just do it by hand. 0 0.28, 0 0.05 is 0 0.33, 0 0.46 is 0 0.79, 0 0.79. So one minus 0 0.79 is 0 0.21. You can do this on a calculator. I just don't happen to have my calculator handy right now. So I'm going to just, I just did it by hand. So there it is, 0.21. Okay, so very straightforward if you know the fundamentals of your probabilities. Okay, on to the next problem. <clears throat> Okay, number eight. In the probability distribution to the right, 
The random variable x represents the number of hits a baseball player obtained in a game over the course of a season. So in other words, the baseball player, zero hits, one hit, two hit, three, four, five hits, and the respective probabilities for each of them, okay? Um, and so let's take a look at this. Verify that this is a discrete probability distribution. So let's go ahead and verify that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to pull up this data set in Excel like we've done in the past to save us a little bit of time. And, oh, now I'm gonna split the screen. Okay, so notice how we have the data set over here. And first we need to do is, what we need to do is verify that this is a discrete probability distribution. First and foremost, are the values between zero and one? That's what this we're gonna need to fill in. Are they? They sure are. The second thing we need to verify is that, like we've been doing on the previous problem, the sum of the probabilities equals one, and of course it does. Because it meets both of those criteria, this is a discrete probability distribution because all of the probabilities are between zero and one, and the sum of the probabilities is one. So that satisfies both of those criteria, like we've been practicing for this last several problems or previous problems. Let's move on to the next one. Next one, what we need to do is select the graph that best represents this data. So it's pretty straightforward. It's just a basic bar graph essentially. And so go find the, the graph that matches yours. So you don't, probably don't need to look at all of them, just the first two or three, zero and 0.16. Let's just go process of elimination. Zero and 0.16. Remember that this is 0.1 here. So 0.16 means that it would have to be above 0.1, somewhere between 0.1 and 0.2. So this one's out of the question. This one is way too far. It's at 0.3 something. This one looks pretty good. It's a little over 0.15. That's pretty good. This one is a little over 0.15. So these two so far so good. These two eliminated for my problem. Let's move on to the next one to see if we can eliminate more. At one, we should have 0.33. For this one, 1 1.33, not even close. So this is way under that. Here, 0.3 and above, that looks like the right option for me. So, I mean, you guys have done this before. It's not tough, just match the graph to the probabilities, okay? All right, the, we need to now describe the shape of the distribution. Let's take a look at my distribution. My distribution looks like the following. So what is my shape? Well, first and foremost, we're gonna ask you if it's what type of mode it is. Well, what that means is that does it have essentially multiple things that are, remember that mode is the most frequently occurring element, or does it have one thing that it peaks out at? Well, mine has one single peak, so I'm gonna call it one mode. I'm gonna say distrib distribution has one mode. Where would we see um, multiple modes, if we had things that were tied up at the top, if we had duplicate or identical probabilities for different values, then that would cause us to select other ones. So if we had um, two modes, it would be bimodal. If we had two probabilities that were identical, if we had three probabilities that were identical, we, or more than that, we'd have that. And if we had all of them, identical would be uniform, okay? So, but for mine, we only have one, so this is one mode. And so, finally, they'll ask you what kind of skew this is. Recall from our previous work that this would be skewed right. So mine would be skewed right. As you can see, maybe here, this would be skewed left, okay? And then we've seen the other scenarios if it was symmetric like a bell curve, okay? There it is. All right, now, the next thing deals with our calculation of um, the mean. So recall that here's mu, mean, 
So what we now need to do is draw upon our previous knowledge, our previous um, experience with calculating the means for a distribution, and this is going to be very similar. So what we're going to do here is we are going to find the mean, and we're going to use Excel to do it like we have done. And so in order to do that, I'm going to come over to my data set over here, okay? And the very first step that you're going to do when you want to compute the mean of the random variable is you are going to multiply your value, your x value, by your probability. This looks very similar to the things that we've done in the past, and it is. So I'm going to multiply my x value by, my, by its respective or associated probability. So notice what I did there. And then you can do them individually or you can just drag this down and it will calc and you need to calculate all the x times p of x. Okay, so that would be your first step. Okay, now the next step for that is you're going to sum all of these values that you just obtained. So the mean is going to be the sum of the product of your x value, your value, and your, its respective probabilities, okay? And so there it is. And so this is a very important value. This right here represents the mean, okay? It's the mean of your random variable. So type an integer or decimal. Mine would be 1.6284, that is my mean. Okay. So how do you compute the mean in a uh, probability distribution? Multiply your x value by your probability of it, and then sum all of the ones in your data set. Okay? Now, let's interpret this. Now, um, the, the way that you're going to interpret it, and this is in your notes as well, is the way this works is the mean of a discrete random variable would be the mean outcome of the experiment if the experiment were repeated many times. So in other words, in our baseball scenario here, if this person has multiple seasons and doesn't really improve, then this person is probably going to have about 1.6284 hits. That's what they're going to average out of. That's the probability. Uh, so it's going to end up averaging out around there. That's going to be your key value. So um, let's take a look at what this looks like. A, in any number of games, one would expect the mean number of hits per game to be the mean random variable. No. The observed number of hits per game will be equal to the mean number of hits per game for most games. No. The observed number of hits per game will be less than the mean number of hits per game. No. Over the course of many games, one would expect the mean number of hits per game to be the mean of the random variable. So yes, that's right. So over the course of many games, remember that with statistics, it's not Exact. It is over the course of many games, over, over time, what we're going to do is the mean number of hits per game in a season is going to get very close to that for this particular player. Okay? All right. And finally, compute the standard deviation. All right. So this is the next set of calculations that you're going to need to obtain here. And so let's take a look at this. In order to compute the, the standard deviation, we're going to come back to here and continue our chart. So to compute that, you are going to square your x value. So we're going to square the x value, and then we're going to multiply that by our probability. So let me move this cursor. So to, to calculate the standard deviation of our, in our probability distribution, the next step in the process would be to square the x value 
and then multiply it by the respective probability. Let's go do that for our problem. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to square that value, then multiply it by the probability. So notice what I did there. I squared my x value, then multiplied it by the probability for that x value. So there it is. Of course, that one's zero because the x value is zero, and I'm just gonna drag this down. You can, of course, manually do it for all of them, and it'd be no problem, okay? So, but just for the sake of saving time, I'm gonna do that. All right, with that said, once you've done that, then the next step is to sum or add together these values. Just like we did for the mean, we're gonna do that for these values in this column. Okay, so we're gonna add all of those up. That gives us that particular value. Now, that value is important because what we're gonna do next is now connect this value and our mean. This, this would essentially be the same as the sum of squares when we were doing it before. So this whole thing, when we added these together, that was the sum, the sum of all the squares. That may sound familiar from all the way back in the beginning of the semester. We're gonna take the sum of squares and subtract the mean from it. So that is your next step, and we're gonna be almost done with finding our standard deviation. So that is the next step. We take the sum of squares and subtract the mean from it. And then finally, you're going to take the square root like we've done in the past. This, this value right here, recall we used to call that our variance, right? And so there it is. This right here is your standard deviation, this value, okay? So the standard deviation is 1.552 because they said round to three decimal places, 1.552 would be three decimal places. So what's the standard deviation? 1.552 hits. Okay, did I make a mistake? Round to three decimal places. Oh, I made a big mistake. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. This right here is actually, we have to square the mean. That was a big mistake on my part. I completely forgot that, I knew I made it. Mistake here. Okay, here we go. So I apologize. This right here, here's our uh, sum of squares. We need to subtract the mean squared. Sorry. So you need to subtract the square of your mean from it. There we go. That's better. All right. So our standard deviation is 1.176 hits. There we go. That's better. Sorry about that. So let's recap finding the standard deviation. The standard deviation is found by squaring your x value, then multiplying it by its respective probability all the way down. Then you will add those up, essentially the sum of squares like we kind of talked about in previous when we were finding standard deviation. Then be really careful, don't make the same mistake I made. It's really important that you know that this is your um, your sum of squares, I, I guess you could say SS, sum of squares minus your mean square. That's how we came up with that. So this was your sum of squares minus the, squ the mean squared, and then we took the square root of this value to get our standard deviation. So notice how we took the square root of that to get our standard deviation, and that's it. And we're gonna have more practice with this. This is just your very first one, okay? And that's it. All right, let's move on to part E. What is the probability that in a randomly selected game, the player got two hits? Well, this is actually really straightforward. In order to an answer this question, you just simply need to literally look at your table. What's the probability that a player got two hits? Well, come over to your table here or here, this represents the number of hits. So the probability of getting two hits would be this, 0.2865. All right, and then finally part F. What is the probability that in a randomly selected game, the player got more than one hit? Well, 
if we're referring, when we're kind of reading our probabilities or determining our probabilities, if we're referring to our probability distribution and they're asking for more than one hit, then what you're really being asked to do is add up the probabilities that are greater than one. Yours might be different. It might be more than two hits, three hits, or whatever it happens to be. So for mine, I want the probability of getting more than one hit, which means that it would be the probability of two hits, three hits, four hits, and five hits. Just for the sake of saving time, I'm just going to add all those up, two through five. Notice how the sum of these probabilities will tell me the probability of getting two, three, four, or five hits, or in other words, more than one hit. And so that would be 0.4972. And there it is. Okay? So there's a, that problem number eight was a really good problem because it targeted everything that we're going to see for the rest of um, this particular class. Most of, there, there is one extra topic that we'll see with expected value, but even expected value relates back to what we just did over here on the right-hand side. All right, let's take a look at our next problem. So the following data represent the number of games played in each series of an annual tournament from 1924 to 2004, complete parts A through D below. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to open up another Excel sheet for this, okay? And I'm gonna close out what we just did and hopefully you guys have that kind of saved, but I'm gonna do another example anyways here and you'll see it all kind of be a re repeat of what we just did. All right, so here we go. I've got my data set pulled up of this right here. Notice how this is horizontal and this is turned vertical, more of what we're familiar with. Now, notice how we do not have probabilities given to us. Instead, they go all the way back to the beginning of the semester to give us a standard frequency distribution as opposed to a probability distribution. A probability distribution gives you your x values and then the probabilities for them. A frequency distribution tells you how frequently that value occurred. Is that a big deal? No. Uh, it just adds another layer to your work. So recall that if we wanted to determine the probabilities of each of these uh, games played or whatever it happens to be as your x value for your problem, if we want to do that, we just simply need to calculate that all by ourselves. So recall that if I want to know the probability of a 4 occurring, I need to know what 16 is in relation to the whole, the big picture. Well, what's the big picture? Well, in order to do that, I've got to first add all these up. That tells me that I played a total of 80 games. Okay, so there were... 16 times where four games were played, or sorry, there are 80, 80 occurrences total, 16 times when four games were played, 17 times when five games were played, 19 times when six games were played, and so on. So what does that mean? Well, how could we figure out the frequency of those or the, the probability of those? Simply take each of these values and divide it by the total number that we have. So, and... Recall that you could just do it individually or you could put the dollar sign here if you're going to just drag it down. It's really up to you, but um, you could do it individually. It doesn't really make a difference. So there it is. Those are all my probabilities. If I want to do a quick check, I can add all these up and they should equal one, which they do. You don't have to do the check, but there it is. So what did I do there? I found out my total frequency and I divided each of these 
by that total so I could know what each of these were in relation to all the others in the total. That gave us all of my respective probabilities, which fall between zero and one, and sum add up to be one. It satisfies all those criteria. Now that that's done, I can substitute those values into my um, probability distribution, which is here. But in reality, this is my probability distribution, and so I can actually label this column P of X, the probability of that event occurring, that X occurring. And so there it is. I just put it over there. That way I can continue moving through the problem. Okay? All right. So the prob probability distribution is done. And now from here on out, this is just going to be an identical version to what we did in the previous problem. Okay. We need to match the graph to our probability distribution, okay? So we need to match our graph to our probability distribution. So four should go with a 0.2. Let's take a look here. See the scaling zero to 0.5? This would be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. You need to find that this is not right. That's just a 0.1. This is not right, that's a 0.3. This looks right, that's a 0.2. And this is not right, that's a 0.3. So simply process of elimination looking at the first one tells me the right answer. Okay, great. Okay, so I've got my graph. Now, as you can expect, we're gonna compute the mean of the random variable. So notice how this is just like the one before. So if you didn't feel confident, let's keep on working on it. How do we calculate the mean? Recall that we calculate the mean by multiplying our x value by its respective probability or associated probability. So there's my x value, there's my probability. Be careful, especially in a problem like this, that you don't go and multiply your x value by your frequency. That would give you ultimately the mean, uh, a different kind of mean, the mean like we would get uh, the mean value. That would just be a, a regular mean, not the mean of the probability distribution, okay? So, or not the mean of the random variable, sorry. So there it is, and I'm gonna just drag this down to get the, remain, the remaining ones. And so there are my important values. Now, how do we actually calculate the mean? We add all these up. Now, I'm just gonna drag this over to save myself some time, but notice how if the sum of those, and that right there, the sum, is going to be our mean. That's an important value. So our mean number of games is 5.7375, round to four decimal places. Okay? All right, let's go calculate, oh, well, let's see if they ask for, they might not ask for standard deviation. Interpret the mean of the random variable. Well, we did that in the previous problem. Let's take a look here. The series, if played many times, would be expected to last about 5.7 games on average. That's pretty good. I think that's right. But let's keep reading. The series, if played one time, would be expected to last about 5.7 games. No, because remember with statistics, as we talked about all semester long, it's over time, not just one time. So let's go to see the series that played many times would be expected to last about 4.3 games. Well, 4.3 isn't even in our answers. 5.7 is our mean, so that's the correct one. So in other words, over time, it may not be in five games, but a lot, if a lot of games get played, if this is the data that we've seen, a lot of games get played, we're probably gonna end up at around 5.7 games based on the data that we've seen, okay? There you go. Oh, it does want it. Here we go, here's our standard deviation. So let's go calculate that standard deviation. What was the next step? Once you found your mean, if you wanna keep on going and find that standard deviation of the random variable, then we simply need to first square the x value, then multiply it by its probability. So 
what we need to do is we need to square the x value and then multiply it by the probability. Really easy in a table like this to make a mistake. Square the x value and multiply it by the probability. Easy to not hit the right uh, cell and accidentally multiply by frequency, accidentally multiply by the previous xp of x. You don't want to do that. Be very, very careful. Square the x value, multiply it by the original probability. Okay? And then I'm just going to pull this down to get my values. And then, as we said before, once you've done that, you're going to add up the sum. Recall that this would kind of be known as, as we've said before, this would be kind of our sum of squares. That's what we kind of defined it as, kind of like a sum of squares. And then from here, what do we do next? We're going to need to take our sum of squares and subtract the mean squared from it. So we're going to take our sum of squared value and subtract the square of our mean. So really important that you see that. What was the mistake I made in the previous problem? I forgot to square that mean. That's a really easy piece to miss there. And that would completely mess up the problem like I, I made a mistake on. So there it is. And then finally, this, and we knew this in the past as your variance. And finally, our, the square root of that, the square root of our variance, gave us our standard deviation. So the standard deviation was the square root of that right there. So that we knew, knew as our variance in the past, the square root of that, that tells us our standard deviation. That's the key value that we need to answer this one. Round to one decimal place. Pay attention to your rounding. Pay attention to your rounding. They said round to one decimal place. One decimal place. So my standard deviation is 1.1. One. Okay? And there's another really good complete problem that does it all and more. Really does more because it starts you off with a frequency distribution that you then need to convert to a probability di distribution, then calculate the mean, then calculate the standard deviation, interpret each of those values, and you're, and uh, well, you didn't have to interpret the standard deviation, but we know what standard deviation relates to. All right, there you go. Okay, on to number 10. So on number 10, it says the graph of this discrete probability to the right represents the number of live births by a mother 47 to 52 years old um, who had a live birth in 2015. Complete parts A through D below. All right. What is the probability that, and how about I do this? Um, well, let me zoom out a little bit. What is the probability that a randomly selected 47 to 52 year old mother who had a live birth in 2015 has had her fourth live birth, live birth in that year? Well, basically, this is very similar to the previous problem we had where you just need to go kind of match what they're asking with the probability. So fourth live birth means you're gonna to go to the probability of getting four live births, which is in my case, 0.112. So there's a 0.112 chance that my, my 47 to 52 year old mother who had a live birth in 2015 has uh, her fourth live birth in that, that same year, okay? All right, part B. What is the probability that a randomly selected 47 to 52 year old mother who had a live birth in 2015 has had her fourth or fifth live birth in that year? Fourth or fifth. So fourth or fifth means that we're going to take the probabilities for fourth and fifth and do what with them? simply add them together. I think I can probably just kind of do that one quickly in my head. That looks like 0.219 for mine. Okay? Yours, of course, is probably going to be different. All right, on to the next one. What is the probability 
that a randomly selected 47, 52 year old mother who had a live birth in 2015 has had her sixth or more live birth in that year. Well, here we go again. So six or more means that we're going to take the probabilities for six, seven, and eight because she's, they said six or more, meaning it's, you can have equal to six or more. So that's 0 0.031, 0 0.037, 0 0.046, 0 0.031, 0 0.037, 0 0.046, and of course I'm just going to add those two together, 13, 14, 6, 7, 11, carry the 1, and it looks like 0.114 is going to be my total probability for that event occurring. All right, if a 47 to 52 year old um, who had a live birth in 2015 is randomly selected, how many live births would you expect the mother to have had? Okay, so in order to do this problem, this really connects with what we've done before. So in order to actually do answer this final part to this question, you're going to have to actually create your own probability distribution and then calculate the mean. The mean for that is going to be your answer to this. What would you expect? Well, the expect is essentially the mean of your probability distribution. So here we go. How do we create this? I'm just going to use this one right here. Well, we're going to have the number of live births as our x value. And so what are our x values? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Let me move this over to the right so it's a little bit nicer. So there it is. And then the next thing is going to be our probability. So we know that our probability is going to be connected to that. Notice how what I'm doing is I'm essentially creating my own probability distribution that we've seen in the past using the data in this problem, in this little graph here. So what's my probability of getting a zero? Zero. So look at what I'm doing here. Zero, 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 nothing. Okay? Then I'm going to go through all these probabilities here and list them in my distribution. So 0.237. 0 0.262, 0 0.168, 0 0.112, 0 0.107, 0 0.031, 0 0.037, 0 0.046. Now, to be safe, what should I do to make sure that I didn't make a mistake? I should just do a quick check to make sure that they equal 1. That tells me I probably did not make a mistake in my input of all those probabilities. And now it's just a matter of figuring out the mean of my probability distribution. And so we know that to figure out the mean, we multiply our x value by our probability. And so I'm going to go do that. So multiply my x value by my probability. Now, hopefully, you're starting to get a little bit of the hang of it. And so there it is. And then finally, we add all those up. And that is the mean. And that right there, that 3.061, is what we would expect about the number of live births to be for a 47 to 52 year, year old mother who had a live birth in 2015. And so there it is. Round to one decimal place, be careful. Round to one decimal place, okay? So essentially what we have to do there is for that last part, there is quite a bit of work, but it does show you or demonstrate or forces you to demonstrate that you have a good understanding of these uh, probability distributions and the relationship um, of the mean to that, that information, that data, that probability. All right, on to 11. Now, in 11, we get to the final topic of this class, which is expected value. It's not really too tough, but what it does do is it does draw upon your understanding of um, these probability distributions. So I'm going to kind of keep this spreadsheet up 
even though I'm not gonna use the stuff from it, I'm just using it as kind of a working space. And so we're gonna take a look at this right here. Suppose a life insurance company sells a $250,000 one year term life insurance policy to a 25 year old female for $360, okay? The probability that the female survives the year is 0.999474. Compute them and interpret the expected value of this policy to the insurance company. Let's take a look. In this scenario, the way you wanna kinda of set this up is you're gonna set this up as survive or die, okay? Survive or die. So this person, when you buy life insurance, you're essentially going, I'm not sure if I'm gonna survive or I'm gonna die, but in the event that I die, I want there to be some kind of money that gets paid out to my loved ones or whoever it happens to be, okay? So, or to take care of my funeral costs or whatever. So, in this case, if you survive, you don't get any money and you paid a little bit of money for the peace of mind for the insurance policy. If you die, you do get a payout. You don't, but whatever gets paid out to you and then whoever your, um, your people who are taking care of you and your will, whatever, will, will distribute that money accordingly. So, if you survive, what happens? If you survive, what happens? Well, it means that you're going to, the insurance com company is going to make $360, okay? In my case. So if my 25-year-old female survives, then the insurance company is going to make $360, right? You're going, they're going to get $360 from you. That's it. If you die or if this 25 year old female dies, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is that the you'll have already paid the $360 or she'll have paid the $360, but the insurance company is going to pay out $250,000 to your estate. So you paid 360 and the insurance company is paying out 250,000. So in other words, the insurance company loses 249,640 dollars. So if this 25 year old, I'm just gonna say you, okay? If you survive, the insurance company makes 360 dollars from you. If you die that year, then you pay 360, so that 360 gets taken off of whatever they're gonna pay out. They're gonna lose 249,640, hence the negative 249,640 negative, okay? That's really important to get things started. Now, next step, probabilities. So the probability, I'm just gonna call this your X value, okay? So I'm gonna call this your X value. The probability, What is the probability of those occurring? So what's the probability of each of those occurring? Well, they tell you one of them. The probability that the female survives or you survive is 0.999474. So 0.999474. That is the probability that you survive. How could we easily figure out the probability that you die? Well, we know that the total probability coming all the way back to the very beginning of our class, the total probability has to be one, right? And we see it up here too, as well. So let me actually move this data set down just a notch, one line. We know that the total probability has to be one, so the probability that you're gonna be dying is one minus the probability of you surviving. Isn't that true? So the probability of you dying is one minus the probability of you living, surviving. And so that tells us our total probability. In other words, it looks like there's a high, high, high likelihood that you're gonna survive and the insurance company is gonna make $360. There's a low, low, low chance that you're going to die and the insurance company's going to, in the event that that happens, they will pay or lose 249640 
They're technically banking on you surviving and many, many, many people surviving so they can make their money. And so there it is. Now, with that said, that's not the answer, of course. The answer is essentially just finding the mean of our probability distribution. So this right here is our probability distribution. This right here is what we've been working on all class long to get to. Or we've gone through some real examples, but here's another application of probability distributions and discrete random variables. So we know how to do it. X times P of X. And so that's going to be our X value. Oops. It's going to be our X value times its respective probability. And then we'll do that for both of those. And then what do we do? We add them up. The answer, that sum, that mean, is what the insurance company would expect to make on each person that is in this kind of demo situation. So if we have a lot of people, if we have 100,000 people that are kind of her scenario, the insurance company would probably end up making $228.50 per person. That's what we can expect. Okay, so there it is. All right, we got one more. Oh, we got we got to take that back. Here we go. Which of the following interpretations of the expected value is correct? Let's take a look at this. The A, the insurance company expects to make an average profit of 32.71. Well, there's no 32.71 here. That's not right. So that's out. B, the insur insurance company expects to make an average profit of $228.50 on every 25-year-old female it insures for one year. That looks better. C, the insurance company expects to make an average profit of $2077. That's not in the cards at all. Where are they getting this number at all? And D, the insurance company expects to make an average profit of $359. That's not our numbers. It's B. Okay? And that's the interpretation in, in better language than what I said of what's going on. Okay? All right. Let's go to number 12. Okay. Number 12. I'm going to use this right here. I'm going to leave our little example of insurance up because that is going to be very similar. It's going to help us work through our problem here. In the game of roulette, a player can place an $8 bet on the number 32 and have a 1 out of 38 probability, chance, 1 38 probability, of chance, probability of winning or 1 out of 38 probability of winning. If the metal ball lands on 32, the player gets to keep the $8. Paid to play the game, and the player is awarded an additional $280. Okay? Otherwise, the player is awarded nothing, and the casino takes the player's $8. What is the expected value? Okay, let's, let's go through this. All right. So let's kind of call this win, lose. Let's call it that. Call it real straightforward. Win or lose. Kind of like the previous problem, survive or die, live or die. Okay? Now, what we're going to do, let me move this down one more notch. One, two more. All right. Now, let's talk about the X value for winning. If you win, what are you going to win? So if, in my case, the metal ball lands on 32, then what do you win? Well, if it lands on 32, I win $280. I don't win $288 because I just paid eight, so I'm not winning it per se because I already have it, okay? So all I'm winning is the $280, okay? And if you want, you could even put a dollar sign with it if you want to make it even more accurate, and I could have put dollar signs on this too. If we lose, what do we lose? So if the metal ball does not land on 32, then we lose $8, okay? We lose $8. So if the metal ball lands on 32 for my problem, we will win $280. If the metal ball does not land on 32, we're gonna lose the $8 bet that we placed on the number 32. 
Okay, probabilities. It says a player can place an $8 bet on the number 32 and have a 138 or 1 out of 38 chance of winning. So the 1 over 38 is our probability, and that goes with winning. Oops. So what I can do is I'm going to do 1 divided by 38, and my cell is wrong, so I'm going to need to format my cell so that it um, reports it as just a number. So I just go to the number here, or you can do general. I'll just do general, and it gives me that. So if for some reason your cell gave you like a month, it's interpreting as like some month out of the year. So go over, let me show you again, if for some reason it's wrong, or just simply do the division in your calculator and put that into the cell. Just go to general and label the cell general and we'll give you the number for that. So one out of 38 is that. Now what would be the other probability of losing? Well we know again that the total probability must equal one. So if the total probability must equal one, then 1 minus the probability of winning is going to be the probability of losing. So let's kind of recap before we go further and close this problem down. If my metal ball lands on 32, I'm going to win $280. If it doesn't land on 32 in this game of roulette, I'm going to lose $8. The probability of it landing on 32 is 1 out of 38. Converted to a decimal, that's 1 out of 38. The probability of losing, they don't need to tell me because I know the total probability should be 1. So I, like the very beginning of class, subtract my probability of winning from 1, and that's how I know my probability of losing is 0.973 blah blah blah. Now, the expected value is exactly what we did earlier with our live or die scenario with the insurance policy, the life insurance policy. So I'm going to go calculate the mean of my probability distribution now. So that's x times p of x. And so I'm going to multiply those values together like we've been doing all class long. And there it is. And so now, I'm going to then add these together, and that is my mean. So the expected value is, my expected value actually ends up being negative. Those parentheses around the 0.42 mean that it's a negative value. Losing, losing, losing. So 0.42. So I'm going to do this, it's negative 0.42. Okay, make sure you put the negative in if your value ends up being negative. So my, my value ends up in parentheses and red, that tells me it's a negative value. Make sure you put a negative 0.42. Let's interpret what's going on. The player would expect to lose about 42 cents. Oh, lose about... Oh, sorry. So we're losing 42. So, oh, let me see here. Oh, hold on. Oh, we need to take out 42 cents from the $8. I believe that's what they're looking for. Let me see here. Let me see if that's, if that's correct. Hmm. Player would expect to lose about 421.05. Oh, sorry. This is this is I know what I did wrong. Okay. Okay, sorry, I know this marked it wrong, but let me go and explain that. I didn't read the actual question. So we know that the expected value is to lose negative 0.42. What this means is that the house is going to win. 42 cents every time, you will probably lose 42 cents every time over every single game average. But I messed up, I didn't read this properly. Let's take a look here. How does this play into that? If you play the game a thousand times, how much would you expect to lose? So each time you play, 
you should expect to lose on average 42 cents. The house is going to win about 42 cents from you every time you spin. If you play a thousand times, what would happen? Well, all we got to do like we've done before is multiply that by a thousand. I wasn't paying attention to the actual question. If you multiply that by a thousand, what do you get? Move the decimal place three times, and that's how they get $421.05. So that was, that was my mistake there. And notice how, and how did they know it's 421.05? Um, if I go back over here, and I do the number, and I just do a whole number there. Take a look here. I converted that, and this is probably better to do on a calculator than Excel, because Excel is probably gonna round to two decimal places. I used the whole thing, so this did an estimate, and I, gave, and I wanted the full number. So if you didn't see that, I did, I formatted the cell, and I had it tell me the whole number. I used general and said, hey, show me the entire number, rather than an estimate to two decimal places. And so negative 0.42105, you can clearly see that if I multiply that by a thousand, that's where I get 421 and five cents that is lost over a thousand spins. Okay, and that's it. Number 13 is all for you to do on your own. And that concludes 6.1.